program and we talked about the work you're doing and bringing it home for us on how to prepare for sea level rise at a community and individual asset scale. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Summer. If, if it wasn't so nice out, I'd actually do both thoughts. <laughs> um, first, at the start of this session, Henry said, um, you know, if you stick long, around long enough today, you're going to get a real treat. And I thought she was talking about my talk. <laughs> and, then, and then she talked about kayak trips and restaurants, and so I realized I couldn't really compete with that. Um, so if you are here for those, that's perfectly fine. I'm not offended. Uh, but hopefully we can have a little fun here talking about this. And what I'm going to be trying to talk about is, is how some of this highly scientific stuff, sea level rise, climate change, which you've probably heard a lot of over uh, the recent past and also at this conference, how do you start getting that down to something that a community can digest? And I'm going to talk about some pretty technical things, but at the end of the day, I'm going to have a tool or information that's going to be publicly available that helps communities then really be able to assess their vulnerabilities and start planning for this planning for, the, for these changes that we, we expect to happen. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I don't like to get into the science of climate change. I don't like to get into what causes sea level rise. What I like to talk about is how we might fix the problem, how we're going to solve the problem, how we're going to identify what's at risk. And that's really what this, this talk and some of this stuff is focused on. Um, so climate change preparation. Uh, I really intended this to be kind of a, a three-session talk. <laughs> um, we're going to primarily focus on, on the second one here, vulnerability assessment. But really to start thinking about climate change, and specifically you know, sea level rise, you got to understand what the real risk is. What's the risk? So it starts with, is, sea level rise, is, is a sea level rise combined with a storm surge really going to be impacting my community? Okay. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's more temperature changes. Maybe it's more precipitation increases. Right? So first, what's the real risk? Second is, how does a community then determine what's vulnerable? Right? We're going to get into a little bit of map discussion here. Right? We've seen a lot of different maps, a lot of different presentation of maps. But, but how do you really determine what the vulnerability is to, to your assets in your community, your structures in your community? And then finally, once you figure that out, what, what should the plan be? What are you going to do? Right? And we'll touch on that a little bit, but we're really going to focus today on what really the vulnerability assessment piece is and how do you start really planning for uh, some of the changes that are occurring. All right, so very briefly, I just, I just want to touch on uh, sea level rise. I'm going to walk around a little bit more. So um, what's causing it? Again, I'm not going to, you've heard by a lot about this, but basically there's two things. Thermal expansion of ocean water. So as the water heats up, the molecules get bigger, and they just take up more space. And right? so the ocean water starts to expand. Right? The second one, and probably a bigger one, is input, increased input from land-based sources. So that's your traditional, what you're thinking of is melting of the you know, glaciers, ice caps, increased precipitation. Right? So that makes the water level go up. Now, in the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic, we actually have a little bit more trouble because the rate here is actually higher than the global average. Global average is around 1.47 millimeters per year. In the Northeast, we have it anywhere from 1.75 to about 6 millimeters per year. And that includes the changes in the land. Right? So there's subsidence and other things going on. But it also includes, and this is some re recent work that's been done, changes in, in ocean circulation. So the Atlantic meridional ocean current is believed to be changing because of the temperature changes in the water, which pushes water in different areas. Right? With that change in the circulation, we expect that the Northeast is going to have a higher than average global, uh, a higher than average sea level rise. Why? What's the other reason why it's important? Well, people live on the coast. Okay. In terms of the world, 80% of the population lives within 60 miles of the coast. Right. Three quarters of the major cities in the globe are on the coastline, and that's within about 60 miles. In the U.S., and, and, and the other point is it's not stopping, it's not slowing down. 40% of the U.S. population lives within 30 miles of the coastline, and by 2020, it's projected to be 50% of our population is going to be on the coast. And that's not because of sea level rise, that's because people are moving here, right? So, 
it's not, it's going to be a problem. It's going to continue to become a problem. All right, so you've seen this probably at nauseum today. Uh, this is the U.S. National Climate Assessment. These are the sea level rise curves. And this is kind of the historic global average of sea level rise from actual tie data, okay? These curves then are the projections from the lowest up to the highest. Um, and that's your range. So there's a high variability. So when a community starts thinking about what am I going to plan for, Boy, right off the bat, it's a tough, tough decision. It's tough to know what's going to happen. Right? The other aspect is, you know, well, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people, and frankly, I was one of them at the one point in time. Yeah, you know, ah, I don't know if I really believe in that. Right? These these projections that are way up here, how, how are you coming up with that? Right? I mean, I, I I understand that sea level is rising, but look at the red. Okay. Well, if we zoom in on a small part of the curve, and this is 1992, 1992 time frame when IPCC kind of started doing their original studies and original projections. They came up with some curves, and they were actually much lower than this in terms of projected sea level rise. This blue line here is actually satellite altimetry data that has measured the sea level rise since 1992. And that rate was actually higher, meaning the actual data observations were higher than what IPCC had projected in 1992 originally. That's why they keep going back and reevaluating, looking at glacier melting, all these things. So the reality is that the actual data is showing a significant increase in the rate of sea level rise. Right. So sea level rise is one component that you got to think about, but there's also storm events, right? Um, Storm events could become more intense, could become more frequent. Uh, and a lot of what we're doing right now is looking at the combination of storm events and sea level rise, how they interact. We'll get into this graph a little bit more. This is basically um, a hurricane similar to Sandy. It's a synthetic one, which I'll talk to you about more in a minute. Um, coming off the coastline, the arrows, vectors here all indicate wind speed, wind velocity. And then the color bar is water level. So this would be the storm surge as it approaches the coastline. Okay? And reds indicate higher. So this is, these are results we're using right now to assess vulnerabilities to the central artery system in, in Boston. This chart over here basically shows what we're kind of talking about in terms of water level relative to NAD88. Mean higher or high water today is about 4.5 feet in Boston. In 2050, remember there's a range of projections there. It's anywhere between 5 to 6. 2100, it gets a bigger band because the uncertainty increases you go further out. And then this is the annual high. So, you know, every year you could expect to get a water level. In 2010 today, it's up, you know, almost 7. In 2050, it's increasing, right? The 1% risk water level is in 2010, 10 as today. So that's what people typically refer to as a 100-year storm. I don't use that language, I'll explain later. But the 1% risk of getting a water level up to 10 today is, 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 you know, in 2010 is 10. You can see as climate change, as sea level rise goes up, it comes more and more. I, I guess the point of this is that today, right, we're already at some level of risk. With storms, they already account for, you know, almost a, you know, 90 years of sea level rise, right? And sea level rise is just going to heighten that danger. It's going to heighten that risk probability, okay? Um, you know, and so the other aspect of this is, and we'll, we'll talk about some of these maps in a second, but you really need to start to think about this in terms of a risk profile or what your risk is, because there's a lot of variables here. Um, sea level rise we just talked about. Storms we talked about. There's both hurricanes and nor'easters, which present completely different risk profiles. There's also tides. Um, this is a perfect example of how tides come into play. This is Sandy. So I've showed this slide in a number of places, so many of you may have seen it already. This is, the blue is the actual predicted tide level. The red is what actually occurred in Boston. And then this is the difference between those two. So the green would basically be associated with a storm surge. Okay. Sandy, when it hit Boston, 
only reached 7.4 feet, right? Why? Well, because the peak of the storm occurred close to low tide, I mean, on a drop in tide. So it corresponds to about, that 7.4 feet is about a 30% chance water. Meaning any given year, there's a 30% chance you can get 7.4 feet. So it's not really that high. Remember, if we go back to the you know, annual high, it was about seven in Boston the present day. Sandy, just because of where it occurred in the tidal scheme, wasn't really that big a deal in Boston. Now the waves and winds, this is on the south shore, still have an impact. Okay? So it's another thing you gotta throw in the mix. So far we've talked about what? sea level rise, storms, tides, waves, winds, okay? Starting to add up, right? It complicated. Um, again, and now if Sandy just occurred about five hours earlier, okay, if we're talking about a 9.4, which is less than a 1% chance level, or if you want to think about it in terms of return period storms, greater than a 100 year return period storm in Boston. So we have a lot in here, in, in Boston, right? New York, not so much. They ended up with $50 billion of damages. Okay. So how are we really going to determine what's vulnerable, especially on a community level, okay? There's a lot of information out there, right? There's a lot of tools, there's a lot of maps you can start to look at, right? Some of them have been talked about today, and they're all valuable for different levels of analysis. They're all valuable depending on what your risk tolerance is. Here's FEMA maps, right? So you can conceivably use the FEMA maps. You can go to an area and you can say, okay, here's, here's where my water year, water is going to be in a 100-year storm, so to speak. Here's my base flood elevations, and good. That's, that's what I need to plan, right? Well, there's a big problem. You know, FEMA is only backwards looking, right? They're really all about the insurance, getting the insurance uh, <coughs> coverage out there. And so they're not projecting the future. They're not looking at sea level rise. They're not looking in, in, in the forward. They're just basically taking historical storms and saying, okay, what's, where do I think the 100 year water is going to be? Right? It just considers this 100 year storm. None of this is dynamic modeling. Okay? It, it's basically transect based analysis where they look at a specific transect going along the shoreline and say, what are my waves and, and storm surge going to do on this area? And then they pick another transect some distance further along the coastline, and they just kind of connect the dots as they go. So it's, it's somewhat limited, okay? Especially in region one. Some of the other regions, they do use dynamic modeling to start to assess flood risk. All right, so what about kind of these bathtub models, right? Dan, I'm not gonna pick on you here in this, by any means. This, this is one we actually helped develop for the Boston Harbor Association. They serve a purpose, okay? They're kind of like, as Dan said, that first cut, that first look at, at what might be flooding. This, this is Boston, um, and you know you can start to see where water would go under different scenarios, okay? And they do look at sea levels. You just basically increase your water level, you look at your LIDAR topography, and it's a bathtub, and you can do connectivity, you can not do connectivity, and you get flooding profiles, okay? What do they not do, right? Well, they don't really reflect the dynamic nature of flood, right? It's just an increase in the water level. So what did we just talk about, right? Talk about, you know, winds, waves, right? Port Moisters versus hurricanes. All these different things that can really happen. This is just increasing the water level, right? And where is that water going to be, right? And a lot of times that doesn't include effects of infrastructure, right? Dan's did have some of the levees in there. A lot of places like Boston, they don't account for the Charles River Dam. They don't account for the pumping operations of the Charles River Dam. Those are two important things, especially for the city. And they don't really account for joint flooding conditions. So one thing up that I haven't talked about is then rain increases, right? When you have these storms, you typically get rain, right? That's going to be bigger discharges down the rivers. Right? So you got to take that into consideration too. Right? Then there's these hurricane surge inundation maps, okay, that are available. These are available online. And, they, and I should go back to that. There's there's numerous backup type models. All the, the, the NOAA Coastal Service Centers, those are generally all backup type models. They're non dynamic. They're just looking at the increases in water surface elevation. These are also available. These are hurricane surge inundation. And this is based on a model. It's called the slosh model. Okay? But it serves a very specific purpose. This is looking at hurricanes. Okay? And hurricanes influence on the city of Boston. 
Anywhere where it's green is associated with a category one hurricane, right? Pretty dramatic flood, okay? They serve a purpose. Their purpose is looking at the worst possible scenario for emergency plan, basically evacuation, right? If the hurricane is coming category one, category two, category three level, where's the flooding gonna be? How are we gonna get out? Right? That's what they're looking at. It's a really poor slot sloshes. That means they look at you know up to you know kilometer type spacing in their grid cells. Um, doesn't really include impacts of waves. The errors are relatively large, plus or minus 20% water levels. Um, and it just looks at hurricanes, right? If, if, if I told you what was the biggest risk in, in New England, right, you, you probably wouldn't first say hurricanes. You might think about more easy years as being really the, the first risk. Hurricanes are important. So this is this is another good tool. None of these are bad tools. It's just a matter of what your level of detail you want to understand things at and what your level of risk is for your certain asset, right? If you're talking about a hospital, they're not going to go by this tool. Right? Because they're they have to be operational, they have to be open. Their tolerance for risk is very low. Okay, so there's this high resolution hydrodynamic model, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about now. It's another type of map that gets produced. Okay, it's a little different. The difference is we start to include all these real relevant physical processes. Tides, storm surge, all these things we've been talking about. The issue is it has to cover a large domain. Why? Well, these storms are big. Hurricanes are big. Nor'easters are big. You know, a lot of times they start way out in the middle of the land, way down in, in the Gulf Coast. So you have to get that right to represent the dynamics correctly. What I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about today is, is the development of this BHFRM mod, model. What that stands for is Boston Harbor Flood Risk Model. Okay? It has two components to it, an ad search model, which handles the storm surge, tides, all the list of things over here, including sea level rise, including discharge down the Charles River, Mystic River, and then that's tightly coupled with a wave model, swan, which handles waves and waves up. So it's got everything kind of in there when you start to look at risk. So why are we even doing this? Why, why are we even considering this really complicated dynamic model? Well, are the existing maps good enough? Right? Are they good enough for you to go invest in, say, for Massacre, a billion dollar project to protect their terminal system, right? They're gonna rely on that to model to do that. They need to know when they have to do it. They need to know what their risk profile is. It's only a 1% chance, or a 0.01% chance that they get wet. They may not invest a billion dollars today for that, okay? So here's, here's just this really simple, this is a bathtub model, it does have connectivity in it, it doesn't look at dams or anything like that. And we just said, okay, in 2070, let's raise the water level up to approximately 12 feet, right? So you go up there and you say, we're gonna put it at 12 feet, and it'd be 88, here's what it's like, okay? It's all yellow, right? So the water from salvation is flat, it's just a bathtub, okay? This is that same, water level for a dynamic model, okay? Same, it's, it's a 12 foot combined sea level rise and storm surge. Kind of corresponds to a 2070 intermediate sea level rise level with a, you know, a fairly decent hurricane or noise survey. Okay? Pretty big differences in, in what you're seeing flooding, right? The whole Charles River Basin back here is flooded under the bathtub model. There's a lot more flooding in the north. Here, that's that's all protected by the Charles River Dam, its pumps, its systems there, and because of the way the storm interacts. But on the south, there's much more, it's much deeper. There's, there's bigger expensive flooding, okay? So there's a pretty big difference in terms of what the bathroom model is showing you and what the dynamic model is showing you. Why is that? Well, I just took a slice down here of water surface elevation and the maximum that occurred during the storm through Boston Harbor, right? Again, bath the bottle, we just have a line right here at 12, the whole way across, right? Here, the storm comes in, the surge gets piled up against the shoreline. It includes, you can see these little dips, those are wave effects. So wave setups, wave breaking. This gap right here is just this island, which is a very high elevation. You can see the peak in the south is up to 13 feet. That's a foot higher than what your bath the bottle would project, okay? So the, the dynamic, influence of waves and winds and track line and, and pressures and all these things start to make changes in your flood risk. 
Okay, so I'm not saying that you know that level of analysis would be needed for every particular case, but in some cases your risk is high. I mentioned the hospital. Um, I mentioned the central artery in Boston. That's who we're doing the study for. Why? Well, they can't afford the central artery to get flooded or shut down. One vent building goes. They have to shut the tunnel. They can't pump the air directly through the tunnel. Right? So it's not just water getting into the tunnel. It's any egress. It's any connection. It's any vent building that gets affected. Right? So, you know, the level of detail and the importance starts to become critical when you start looking at these high risk infrastructure features. The dynamic model also answers a number of additional questions. You know, we can look at detailed flooding pathways. Where's the water really going? How's it getting there? How much volume is it? How long does it last? Right? These are these are models operating in a time scale. Right? So when the water comes in, it's maybe it's not good enough just to know that it got wet. Maybe you want to know how long it's going to be wet, right? How long before you can return? Um, what's causing the flood, right? Is it the storm surge? Is it the wave? Is it the wind? Is it the increased discharge? And then the other really important thing you do is you can start to test engineering adaptations, right? And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. All right, so the other key piece of this, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, is, is basically how we determine what the risk profile is for an area. So we use Monte Carlo submission. So instead of just running one storm, like what a hundred year storm is, right? Well, you tell me what a hundred year storm is, because I don't know, right? It depends, there's a lot of variables, right? A hurricane comes up. It can have a different track, it can have a different radius to maximum winds, it can have a different approach, right? Depending on where it goes, it can com produce completely different flooding patterns. You could have two hundred year storm events that, like Sandy, Sandy was a hundred year plus level um, in terms of power, in terms of energy, but it occurred at low top. Did it produce a hundred year flooding? No. Okay. So you got to start to think about all these different joint probabilities and statistics. So that's what we're doing with this Monte Carlo simulation. And, it, and it's based on storms, hurricane sex, developed by Kerry Emanuel at MIT. He looks at a large, statistically robust set of storms. And then we don't have to worry about joint probabilities when the storm occurs. So we're looking at 5,000 storms that come up hurricanes, and also more recent. And we can apply those in both present and future climate change scenarios, okay? So you can look at the 20th century climate and the 21st century climate. Storms get more intense as you go into the 21st century, okay? All these storms can then be combined with sea level rise. So you can say, let me look at my storm set present day, see what my flooding risk is, and then let me look at 2050 and see what my flooding risk is. Let me look at 2100 and see what my flooding risk is. We can start to compare those results. All right, so I mentioned it requires a big area, right? Here's, this is the, the Foss Harbor flood risk model, BHRFRM. This is the grid, this is the region, this is the area that it covers. So it's got everything in it from you know, Venezuela, through the Gulf of Mexico, all the way up to, to Nova Scotia. It's a big area, right? Lots and lots of points where information is calculated. You have, it has the ability to have this unstructured grid. What does that mean? I just took a cut out of the Gulf of Mexico. So you can look at in the Gulf, it has kind of coarsely spaced nodes. And as you get more and more into the areas where there's urban environments, you can get really high resolution. Every five to 10 meters, you're getting information on it. You're getting what the waves are, water levels, winds, okay? Here's what the model actually looks like up in Boston. This is the financial district here. I'm just showing the grids, really high resolution. Um, so every one of these little points that you can barely even see is a notable and pointed information of what your flood risk is. And this is another view. This is, again, the financial district start to include infrastructure impacts, the buildings, things of that nature. Use the same LiDAR data that they use in bathtub models, right? We just now have the dynamic coastal processes that are related. So this is what that grid looks like when you start to incorporate elevations. And then we calibrate, okay, that's key. This is, I just extracted, this is Hurricane Katrina. This is down in the Gulf Coast. And again, we're looking at high water marks, we're looking at tidal records. We compare how the model compared, compares to the actual observations and make sure we're getting that accurately correct. Up in Boston, we simulated Hurricane Bob, Blizzard of 78. 
Okay, we looked at the historical compares to the high water marks before we even in, consider doing all those mining power simulations, which is 5,000, you know, hurricanes, 5,000 more resources. All right. This is some results from the Boston Harbor flood risk model. Okay, I should mention, as we continue to talk about this, all these right results are going to be publicly available from MassDAT, okay? Um, and, and they cover a good portion of the state. You can go certainly look at the coastline anywhere in the state, and then there are very high resolution results in the city of Boston. Okay? So this, is, this is one example storm that we grew up at at, uh, at Boston. You can see the flooding. One thing to note, Charles River Basin starts to fill up. Now you can notice it stays blue for a long, long time. Dams right here, pumps are working, okay? There comes a point where the pumps no longer can keep up. Dan already kind of stole some of my thunder, because he, he said, well, there's somewhere that it might be going around it. Well, he, he's right. <laughs> so, and, and these preliminary results, and this is about the year 20, uh, 2100, so it's a ways out, but, and with the sea level rise and a relatively moderate storm, Here's a Charles River Dam again. Pumps are working. Water level actually flanks the dam on both sides. The dam doesn't actually get over top. The design is good. But there's areas that are lower that, that flank the system. So we can start to look at how much water is actually flanking, how much water is getting into the basin. You can see the pumps even keep up with the additional water that's certain, that during certain portions. These are the types of maps we start to get out of. This, I'm jumping down to Galveston, we did a study for EPA. This is the full Monte Carlo results. We don't have the full Monte Carlo results done at Boston quite yet. And as opposed to just, you know, where's water going to be, we actually start to present, what's your risk profile, okay? So this is in 2100, sea level rise, in, in Galveston, and this is your risk profile, okay? So red is basically 100% chance you're going to get wet any given year. Right? So you can say, okay, let me go to 2100. What's happening in 2100? If I live on this little island right here, right, I'm getting wet. There's a 100% chance I'm getting wet that year. Why? Sea level rise has increased the tides high enough that they're getting wet every day. All right, just sea level rise. If I go to somewhere that say yellow, and go to a 2% risk profile, that means there's a 2% chance in 2100 that that area is going to get wet. Okay? As you can imagine, the model can also tell you how deep it would be, what your percentage is for a certain depth. Okay? So this is basically the, a risk profile map that you start to get as opposed to kind of a flooding map. Alright, some of you probably have seen this before, but this is, this is how these results actually present on the web, how you'd actually be able to start to view them. You can view those risk maps, but you can also start to look at results in the model domain. So all these little dots that you see popping up here, that's those are the nodes in the model, right? Those that white grid I showed you, right? That's where you can start to get information. So I can click anywhere in here and look at what my risk profile is. What's a risk profile? Real quick. So exceedance probability. That's basically your percent chance in that year you're gonna get wet, right? So at this particular node, you know, you are dry, you know, that year, you're going to be dry, you know, for, you know, there's, there's not, it's a pretty low risk area, right? If you, there's a 1% chance, or a 10% chance here, that you're going to have 1.82 meters of water at that location, right? There's a 1% chance that you're going to have 3.1 meters of water at that location, okay? So how, how can you start to really use this? I'll just show you quickly. What we did here for EPA was start to look at engineering adaptations and how they function in terms of cost basis. So we're going to look at an area, everybody's familiar with the seawall in Galveston, right? I'm going to zoom into a node that basically is seaward of the seawall. Okay, so this is on the beach. Okay, as suspected, this is results in 2017. You know, there's a 100% chance you're going to get water there, and then as you go up, it's deeper and deeper water, right? So it gets wet out. If I jump to the other side of the seawall, same year time frame, right? I'm dry, the wall's working well, 0.0005% chance, right, of getting wet, okay? Now, let's go over further to the west and look at an area where there's no seawall. 
This is at the same elevation, okay? But the wall isn't there, okay? Now you're talking about there's a 50% chance you're getting one, okay? What we then could do is say, well, what if we extended the seawall to the west? We rerun all the Monte Carlos, we come up with a new risk profile and see what that saves in terms of cost, right? Because this can be tied to an economic model that then projects how much it costs if you don't do anything versus how much it costs to build the seawall, okay? The other interesting thing we can do with this, you go anywhere in here and say you want to look at a specific location here, you can start to understand what your tolerance is. Say that was a hospital, right? I can look at that and say, okay, there's a 1% a chance I'm going to get wet in 27 here, right? Do I need to do something about it, right? I can jump to 2100 and say maybe that percentage goes up to 20%, right? I can then know at what point in time I need to start to take action. And depending on how comfortable you are with risk, you can then decide to implement an adaptation at a certain time. For certain areas, maybe, yeah, no, I can live with 1% risk. Other areas, maybe not, right? Central artery can't, hospitals can't. Okay. Almost dead. Another tool that we have here is, uh, jump right back into this, is start to really be able really be able to visualize some of the flight. So this is results from the Boston model again. And we're gonna just take a snippet here and you can start to, this is what all the people will be available as well. You can zoom in in an area and start to look at flood pathways. This is the financial district in Boston. Hope you can see that okay. And you can start to look at where water's going into the city and what the access ways are. Okay. This is down by the New England Aquarium, right? Floods in, in here and gets into the financial district. There's a T stop right here, the Grand T stop. We, we're calling that ground zero right now. <laughs> Water gets in there and it gets into everything. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty vulnerable area. And then go over here, here's the Charles River Dam down in this area. And you can start to see the colors refresh here where the water starts to flank the dam, okay? So this is another tool that you can start to use to look at these results. Yep. So, let's skip over that. <clears throat> the last thing I wanna say is that using these results, you can sometimes solve, as a community, you can sometimes solve regional problems by really minor projects, okay? This is something we looked at for UMass Boston, you can see these red circles here. These were where floodwaters were entering the system. So all of Morrissey Boulevard was flooded, but there was only really one area that the water was coming from. So as opposed to building a big seawall around the entire city, right? You can you can buy a heck of a lot of time by just doing some small projects to, to protect your, your system. Okay? And again, using that same risk profile I presented earlier, you can then start to know when to implement your solution as well, right? Okay, so a lot of information there. Uh, just some real quick conclusions. So climate change is a reality, right? Coastal flooding is happening, it's gonna, it's predicted to increase, so we gotta start at least thinking about it. That doesn't mean we have to go out, build a seawall area, okay? Like for that example, in East Boston, the solution was actually a berm and a marsh system for resiliency that, that got you through to about 27. At 2070, there was enough flooding pathways happening in other areas where it didn't matter anyways. Evacuation was your only option, okay? I would claim detailed knowledge is required to capture all the important physical processes, okay? To really define your risk. Does that mean you have to do it everywhere? No, okay? There's some areas that might be, you know, not non-urban, lower, risk that you don't, you can use standard bathtub first cut approaches to start to assess your vulnerabilities. In other areas, cities, high urban environments, important things, water treatment, wastewater treatment, you need to get your risk profiles right in order to, because the investment money is pretty big. The other thing I'd say is, I get a lot of, oh geez, that's crazy, right? You're modeling the whole, as 
Atlantic Ocean, that's going to cost millions of dollars to do and crazy amounts of computer power. And I run 5,000 swim events. How can my local community have anything to do with this? Okay. Well, you're partially right. It, it does take a lot of computer power to do this. But it's done. Right? The SDOT, Federal Highway Administration, has paid for it. The model's available. It's attainable to individual communities. Right? You have to expand the model domain in your community to cover your upland areas. But this type of approach is no longer unattainable. And we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this for a community. Right? City of Cambridge joined in to the Boston project for $10,000 to get their community and their vulnerabilities assessment done. There's a vulnerability assessment piece that comes after that, but they got the results. Right? So this is just another tool that's available. All right, so I would tell you, just to wrap up, I, I do have these fact sheets, these frequently asked question sheets about the model, how they could be potentially used at a community level, how it gets done, what the results mean, um, they're available here. You can grab them afterwards. If it comes to me, I'll be happy to provide them to you. Um, so with that, uh, I'll get my time up. Thank you.